Oh, welcome to the top M and A entrepreneurs. Today, my guest is Andrew Swiler. Just recently, back in June 2022, bought a software SaaS company doing 2.2 million dollar revenue. It's called Lanteria. It's an HR package uh, runs on SharePoint. So, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excited to share the story. Yeah, let's so let's kind of rewind about and what you were doing before you decided to purchase this company. I mean, I everybody can go to LinkedIn and see what he did, but looks like you worked for a number of companies uh, and tried to fix Polaroid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I mean, I started my I started my career in private equity, and I guess my claim to fame would be in the first three years of my career, I worked for two different companies that acquired Polaroid. Um, so very few people can say that they, that they were part of <laughs> companies that acquired Polaroid, but I did it twice. Uh, so I did that for about five years. Um, it was mostly in turnaround work. So it was pretty, pretty grinding. Uh, and I ended up leaving that to go travel. Uh, so I told my boss I was going to go to Europe and go write for six months. And he was like, okay, you're clearly burned out. You need to get out of here. So <laughs> I went to Europe and I ended up meeting my wife actually. When I was in Europe, I was on a kayaking trip in Croatia, uh, met this woman on the beach on this little island in Croatia, ended up traveling with her. And then I convinced her to move with me to San Francisco uh, after that. So we moved to San Francisco. I knew I didn't want to go back into private equity. I wanted to work in technology, something that was growing. And I became like a fractional CFO for software companies. And after a couple of years, my wife uh, decided she hated San Francisco and said, I'm moving back to Barcelona, where she was from, and you can come with or you can stay here. And I made the hard decision and we moved back here to Barcelona. I didn't speak the language, didn't know what to do. Um, and at the same time, my wife had started this eyewear company and I joined her in the eyewear company. I helped her raise some funding, helped her with some of the marketing stuff. And six years later, we sold that company. And after that, I was just kind of looking like, what was I going to do next? What I, I did a little bit of venture capital work, worked, uh, worked for a family office, worked for a venture capital firm. And I'd always known about these like search funds. I had known, you know, obviously coming from private equity, I'd known people that were buying these like smaller companies, not in like the private equity world. And I thought it was interesting and decided like, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to see if I can do this too. And obviously living overseas in Barcelona is super hard for raising money. Uh, but luckily COVID came around and made things much easier for me. Now I'm just a guy on a screen, just like you and I are yeah, right now. Yeah, I can't travel. Yeah, I get it. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So it made, it made a huge difference and it basically changed my life. Like I was able to talk to investors that before would have been like, yeah, fly on out to San Francisco. Let's have a conversation. And now we just sat and talked about the deal and we ended up closing it uh, pretty quickly. I mean, we, it, it was a good enough deal from a price perspective that the investors that we brought on understood it right away. They're like, great deal, great price, big opportunity. I'm, I'm in. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about some details on that, but I have to go back to uh, uh, when we were raising funds for our startup, Turtles, Turbo Squid, a uh, investor tagged along with us that came to the meeting and we asked, uh, so where are you from? It, Intel brought and uh, Advantage Capital brought somebody and we asked him, where are you from? And he goes, we're from Kodak. Like, <laughs> why are you interested in this deal? Because like, we're trying to diversify before we die or something. <laughs> Yeah, Polaroid. Polaroid wish they would have done that as well instead of just turning yeah. it into a piece of intellectual property. Yeah. So let's get back to this deal. So tell me when you say search fund, were you a – and I talked to self-funded searchers, there's independent mm -hmm. sponsors, and there's search funds. What, where were you in this? I was a self-funded searcher, I guess you would call it. I mean, I, I would like to be in the independent sponsor space, but unfortunately, you know, until you have a little bit more credibility and a little bit more history, uh, it's harder to play in that that game. I mean, that's a higher league. Those are deals that, you know, you're looking to raise 20 to $50 million and it's a little bit more complex. So I would call myself a self-funded searcher. I was out there looking. I, I just liked doing it. I like Honestly, you'd get to look at SIMs, you'd get to look at confidential information mem memorandums and read about businesses and learn about industries. And for me, that was just fun. So I would have done it for free. I don't the searchers that take money to go search, I always tell them like you guys are you guys are wusses. Like you guys should be doing this for fun. Like if you like doing this, you shouldn't be taking a salary for doing it. 
Yeah, yeah. I I just had a guy on the phone earlier today. He was trying to raise a fund for a search. Like, I, look, I don't have any experience helping you raise one hundred fifty thousand dollars so you can look for companies to look at. I I don't. <laughs> I don't even know what the proposition it would be to an investor. <laughs> I, I don't I mean the, for the investors it's great so I I know some people that are search fund investors I mean they get this they get the step up with their it's like you know they put in 50k and all of a sudden that 50k is worth 150k and they're able to you know invest in these deals get first look negotiate the terms a lot of times so it's it's attractive and you know there's debt on it there's there's certain things that make it attractive but I don't get the idea of I mean I get you like just got your MBA and you you know you got to pay off the debts and things like that but I feel like there's just other ways to make money in the meantime, like through consulting or something that it's like, okay, I'm going to consult and on at nights, I'm going to read Sims and, you know, send emails or I'm going to hire a guy in India to send a bunch of emails for me and I'm going to write the copy. That's it. Fine. Fill out the, have them like, fill out the NDAs, get the Sims <laughs> and uh, ask for the financials if you like the deal. And then the, what's about that? Yeah. I, I uh, had a, more deep into the conversation, I, I also was talking about, well, you know, if you do these step ups, which is two and three X, sometimes it creates this entanglement three to five years down the road that looks like a balloon payment to your business that you're not going to like. Yeah. 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 No, some of the, some of the structures, I mean, some of the financial structures inside of, of search funds, you know, the, whether it's the debt structuring, whether it's the, you know, the preferred shares, the the coupons that go with it. It definitely eats into the economics for the searcher and for the, the buyer. I mean, we've gotten to the point. So we raised, you know, one of the mistakes that we made was we didn't raise enough capital. So we raised enough money basically to close the deal, which was really stupid in hindsight. Uh, we had some opportunities to bring in extra capital that would have helped us with working capital. And I was like, no, this company has been profitable for years. We got plenty of room here. And I really didn't put the calculations correctly of, you know, that debt that we were paying off. And especially now that interest rates have gone up, um, you know, the, the preferred shares that we have with our, with our uh, investors that we don't have to pay them if we don't want to, but that, you know, compounds. Um, and there are certain things that I wish at the time we would have raised, but, uh, you know, we planned, we were like, let's close the deal. Then we'll put together sort of like this restructuring because it, it was a it was a turnaround. So we said, we'll restructure it a little bit. And then in six months, we'll go back out to the market and raise the rest of the money. Well, what happened was the market tanked. And six months later, instead of going out to the market for that, we were basically scrambling to figure out how to bootstrap this company, which we've done. I mean, we've grown it, I'd say, I think 35%. Uh, we've grown revenue. But a lot of that has just been, you know, tapping into current customers and being like, hey, what do you guys need? What do you need built? We'll buy that. We'll build this. We'll do that. So it deviates from our plan and deviates from our focus, but it gives us cash and it has, you know, 60 to 75% margins on it. So it's hard to, hard to say no. Yeah. Let me go back to how you started. And did you decide we're going to go software versus we're going to go buy boring essential business products needs or I was I didn't have a lot of choice because I live in Barcelona. Um, yeah, I did. I did look at a lot of boring businesses, like the typical sweaty startup type of businesses. Yeah, uh, I tried to convince my brother, who's my brother's a chef. Uh, he's actually a very good chef, but he's a very good like operations guy. And I tried to convince him to buy a dumpster company at one point during the pandemic, like in 2020. I called him up. I'm like, let's buy this dumpster company. It's in Minneapolis. It's across the street from where you live. I was like, get out of the restaurant business. It sucks. The restaurant business is terrible. Let's do this. And he was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he thought I was absolutely insane. He was like, this is the craziest thing anyone's ever said to me. He's like, you, something's wrong with you. So when I I'd rather put you, stuff in their mouth than deal with the stuff that comes out. So get out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but like nothing, I, like I tried to convince him. I was like, but dude, you're really good at operations let's buy a company together and i'll run the finance and the marketing and sales and you run the the operations and he was like what how how do you even buy a company like who who would buy how are we gonna get the money and i told him like don't worry like we'll find a good business and we'll get the money but i couldn't convince him so for me the only thing that was really an option was to be remote and i've always worked remote i've worked remote for 12 years so for me managing remote teams and running remote teams has been something i've done for a long time and I knew that was really my only, 
my only path here was I had to buy a company that was fully remote uh, and that we could continue to be fully remote. Otherwise, <clears throat> I really wasn't going to have an option. So I looked at some e-commerce businesses, but e-commerce, I've done e-commerce in the past and it's a grind. I mean, SaaS yeah. is a grind, but it's a grind that has better margins and it's <laughs> location independent yeah. all the time. But e-commerce is, it's, it was too tight. I didn't want to get back into that. Yeah. What, uh, how many companies did you look at before you selected or landed on Lanteria? So I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I calculate about 2000 Sims or, or companies. 2000 I Sims. I would say I looked at 2000. I was on Axial. I was on Biz by Cell. I was on, for me, it was just reps. I mean, it was just yeah. looking at these and you would triangulate around the market. So when Lanteria came, I knew it was an interesting business because it was a business that didn't have a lot of, uh, it, it, it had a big TAM, which is pretty rare. Usually you get into these types of, uh, by the way, folks, that's total addressable market. Yeah. Total addressable market. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, you get into a lot of these businesses. If you look on acquire.com or if you're looking on biz by sell, a lot of these businesses have a, a top. They're like, you're in a very, very niche market and maybe the margins are good. Maybe the business is growing, but like you're usually in a very niche position or you're buying a product that competes with everyone. It's like there's a million marketing SaaS products that are, you know, trying to sell Instagram likes and that, that type of crap is for sale everywhere. Like there's people that spun up businesses, made a decent business, but as a purchase, it's a terrible purchase. Like you're going to get slammed if, if that's what you're going to try and buy. But yeah, I was, I looked at probably 2000, I would say across all the different platforms. And so when Lantaria came, it was like a blinding red light. It was like, this is, this is outside the curve. This was something that I hadn't seen before. and we needed to take a swing at. And the original terms that the guys were proposing were not very good, but I knew from a product perspective, it was interesting in the situation that they were two guys in Ukraine. Uh, the situation in Ukraine was deteriorating. They were becoming motivated sellers. And eventually we were able to push them to you know a multiple that was very yeah. attractive. So what did it start out at? They started, I mean, they wanted, when they first went out to the market, uh, they had a really good 2020, like COVID gave them a huge bump. And so they went out to the market looking for basically 3X uh, ARR. So they were looking for about 3 million, something like that, 3.2 million. Um, mm -hmm. And then 2021 went back to, they reverted to the mean. Like this is a company that's been pretty much flat in sales. They've done between 1.5 and 2 million for six, seven years. So they reverted back down to the 1.5 million in 2021. And we just said to them, like, forget about 2020. That just was a COVID bump. We're not going to, we're not going to take that. And as the, the, the war in Ukraine got closer, there were more things that were negotiable. I mean, they, they, uh, Lanteria takes all the, all the contracts or one-year contracts. So they had a lot of deferred revenue. And when we started talking about deferred revenue, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, what is deferred revenue? And I was like, all this revenue that you're collecting isn't revenue. This is debt that you're getting from your customers are giving you a loan. And then you are paying them back with services throughout the year. And they were like, what They'd are you pay, talking Your about? customers would pay up front. You'd have it on the deferred revenue and the liability. So yeah. they, they didn't book it like that. They just booked all revenue as revenue. Yeah. And so when we, when we came to them and we were negotiating, we were like, well, this isn't revenue. Like this is deferred revenue. This is, this is a liability. And you know, we, we couldn't get them to agree to that. They were like, no, this is money. Like we take this money and we, because they don't we get use it. generally accepted accounting principles <laughs> in Ukraine, I guess. Yeah. Well, they were, they were running a U.S. based LLC, but I, I know SaaS companies that are doing the same thing. Like I know plenty of SaaS companies that they just book, you know, cash in is, is revenue. Yeah. Um, but people don't realize that there's, you know, certain tax advantages too of booking deferred revenue that, that it can be attractive for you. But we had to, we had to go back and forth with them on that and the deal. And then as the war uh, got closer, then they started seeding these, like they started saying like, okay, so some, some whatever. Like outside pressure is going, oh my God, we're lots of things going on. Yeah. Yeah. They had, I mean, their employees were concerned. They had U.S. based employees as well, and the U.S. based employees were concerned. Clients were concerned, very concerned. I mean, they were they were getting clients weekly, you know, saying like, "Hey, what's the plan here?" They were they were requesting you know information about where their data was, 
uh, you know, getting detailed information about like where the employees were. And so it was, it was a big deal. And I mean, even we had a lot of risk. Where we was took, our data? Took on the company. Uh, everything's in Azure cloud. So, I mean, e either, oh, so it's, either a, it was on it's on Amazon somewhere or somewhere. It's yeah. in Azure. So it's in Microsoft's Azure Microsoft's, uh, cloud. So me, it's, yeah. For our European customers, it's in Ireland. And for our US-based customers, it's in the US. And for our Australian customers, it's in Australia. So the Ukraine war had absolutely nothing to do with, <laughs> with where the data was. But yeah. obviously, people are concerned about that. Yeah. And they, uh, all the developers, they, what was the kind of questions you asked? Like, are you staying on board to continue to develop this? Or do you, did you have the skills to go find somebody to replace them? No, we didn't. I mean, it's, it's built on pretty antiquated technology. It's built on VB.net, which is a pretty antiquated <clears throat> Microsoft tech stack. So yeah. we did not have a backup plan. Our bank, our SBA lender, when the war, we were actually in closing when the war started. And the lender called me and was like, what's your plan? And I was like, oh, because two of my partners are from India. And I was like, we've got these guys in India and they've got it under control. We got a whole pipeline of talent that we, <laughs> we can bring in. And they were like, oh, cool. All right. Sounds good. And, but we really, we did not have a very strong plan for if people left if people disappeared we, was was their code well documented you could see notes in there um it's okay it's documented i wouldn't say well documented i would say it's okay it would have been um it wouldn't have been disastrous for the company because i mean most of the company the, the product is built uh there's not like a lot of yeah. active development going on. it would have been more of like a slowdown for six to nine months to like actually to get the roadmap. Like if we were to develop new things for the product, and, it would have and, slowed us down a lot. And some, some of your guys coming in there and breaking a couple things and having to fix it yeah. real fast. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It would have, yeah. it would have been some issues, but it, it was more of just a slowdown than anything else. But yeah. there, there were, there, there were two guys that are ba that are still based in Ukraine that are sort of critical pieces of infrastructure for us that know the product inside and out. And, even after we acquired it, like last December and November, there was a lot of issues with electricity and these guys were disappearing for weeks at a time. And like one of our head of support that basically handles like all the tickets. Uh, and that was, that was a key, key difficulty that we, yeah. that we had to deal with. I, I, I'm curious about this because you said, you know, they're in Ukraine. I tried to buy a business. It was a portfolio of courses on Udemy and it sold a million courses, really profitable. And I tried to find an SBA lender. I swear nobody wanted to send money, SBA lenders, over to the UK. I got rejected by probably out of the, I don't know, 30 or 40 SBA lenders. I talked to go, no, no, it needs the money needs to stay inside the United States. These yeah. guys, so it was an LLC. The, these guys were running everything in the US. So the company that we acquired was a US-based LLC. And we paid the money to the LLC. So the money oh. did not go to Ukraine. So the, the purchase was of the assets and we purchased it from the LLC. So the, the transfer went directly to the LLC. Interesting. So they had a bank in the United States. Yeah. yeah I mean, they, they work with Chase. It, it was an LLC that had been around for 12 years uh, yeah. in the U S so it was, and they ran their whole business through the U S so that was really the only reason that we could do it. Like if, if they had been running the business through Ukraine, we would have never been able to do the deal, but it was a U.S. based business. Yeah. So you had some macro force majeure pressures moving the multiple down uh, to, you know, to whatever it is at 1.5 million revenue in 2021. Um, and you guys, how long did it take you to get to that point? Do they, they agreed on that multiple and say, yes, we'll do it. It took nine months. It was from nine uh, months June. to agree on that back and forth. Yeah, so we well, from we the start of you were asking that sim and getting that information. Yeah, we we didn't go back and forth. We just told them from the beginning we would pay them this. We said we'd pay you one x revenue. We said whatever trailing twelve months revenue is, we'll pay you one x. Yeah. Um, and they they disappeared for a while. That was in uh yeah in August. I remember I was on vacation in August twenty twenty one. And I was talking to those guys. We made the offer. Didn't hear from them again till like October. Uh, they said no. They came back in October. We chatted again. They came back in December. We chatted again. Then the war was starting to sit on top. And in December, they said like, okay, we can agree on, on this. 
And then it was again in February, we went back with some of the things about like deferred revenue, some of the things that were still sort of like floating around in the deal, in the deal points. And we basically just said like, everything that's still floating around, you either take our deal or we just walk away. Like we're taking on way too much risk here. And they said like, okay, that's fine. And we had gotten investor money. Like it, it was December is when I started calling investors. Um, basically just cold called every investor that we got. Uh, talk to them. I, I live in front of this park and I would walk up and down the park every night and talk to people on the phone and convinced five got five people to give us... Is this us... in Spain or is this in Barcelona or was this in, in Barcelona? States? Yeah. I, in I Barcelona? In, yeah. Just in my I would walk, and, walk and talk on the phone. They're all... I mean, all of our investors are American. Um, like we're invested in Tiny Seed Capital. Uh, they gave us money, Smash VC. Yeah. Andrew and then, from Tiny Capital? Gave you money? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Einar and and Rob oh. Walling from Tiny Seed Capital. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, similar to similar names. I was like, uh, different I, group. I know that guy. I don't know him, but I know his <laughs> little. Yeah. No, they're. I mean, they're famous like angel investors. They they invest in small SaaS companies. Yeah. Uh, this was their first sort of deal in like this type of this type of space. But yeah, we w closed the deal pretty rapidly with them. Uh, then we had to convince an SBA lender uh, to. To help us out, I actually got an introduction. You know Xavier Helgeson from Enduring Ventures. Yes, yeah, in San Francisco. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he in, he introed me to his to an SBA lender. He was like, "This guy, I'll get the deal done. Like he'll move fast, and I'll get the deal done." And he was right. Like I'd been dealing with these SBA lenders that were like dragging their feet, taking forever to get back. Can to I ask us. for one more piece of documentation? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's of like a financial proctology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These guys in from introduction. To closing was in three weeks. I, uh, I was so introduced who, to them. So who can you say? Can you name the guy and what bank? Yeah, he. So they were. They used to be at Dogwood State Bank. Uh, they're not there anymore now. Ben, hang on. I'll if you want, you can put it in the show notes. But yeah, ben I'll put it in the show notes. Was yeah, awesome. Uh, now they work at another bank. What's it called? Uh, Veritex Bank. His name's Ben Terry. Ben Terry. So I'll I'll share Ben's information with you. So Ben is awesome. Uh, ben and John, who's who's sort of his his partner in the group, they do. They were insane. Like I, I had a lot of the documentation prepared because I'd been dealing with these proctologists for for months of you know trying or for weeks trying to get the data. So I had figured out like what does everyone need. So when he and I had an intro call, he was like, "All right, I need this, 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 and that." I sent it to him in like fifteen minutes. I was like, "Here's everything that you need." And we went back and forth, and I mean, there was issues because I live in Spain. I own no assets in the U.S., so those were two things that he was like, "How do you expect me to convince anyone to do this?" That's, that's not Just, working. That's not like a, your balance sheet sucks. <laughs> yeah, my balance sheet's terrible. Like every, everything in the U.S. that I have is in a is in an IRA. So he was like, "We can't even collect anything that you own here." So, and he, they didn't make. They were like, they just. He said, "This is an airball for us." He's like, "You either just." totally lose all this money and we can't really do anything about it and he's like it'll just be a pain in the ass for you to go through like bankruptcy no, you'll lose all, you're not you're only going to lose 25 percent of the money so <laughs> let's kind of move on we we know the government's back in 75 percent of it okay yeah, yeah please <laughs> so he he was fantastic his team was fantastic and they got us into closing and uh then the closing took another three to four weeks I, actually the thing that took the longest was i needed to get health or to get uh life insurance and yeah. getting life insurance abroad is very difficult. Uh, life insurance abroad that the U.S. will cover, is it, that, that a U.S. bank will accept. So I found one company that would give me life insurance in the U.S. And what kind of premium was, was that? It was, it's not a crazy premium. I pay, I pay $130 a month. I mean, I'm a healthy, relatively yeah. young person. So yeah, I pay $130 a month. But it was, uh, it was very hard to even find anyone that would do that would do the deal. Yeah. So you offered, uh, I, I don't know. It's like one time revenue, one point five or something, whatever that was. Yeah, one point six million. Yeah. One point six million. And what did that cap stack look like? Is it was going to be ninety percent SBA, ten percent down payment? What? No, it's it's uh, it was. So we got a million. The SBA was one point one million, and uh -huh. then we raised six hundred fifty k. 650k in, through 670k from investors that how many this is kind of a effort that I'm working on you know teaching people how to raise money but 
how many investors did you have to talk to 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 raise those funds? I contacted five hundred investors. Five hundred investors casting I, I a wide net. <laughs> yeah, I, I contacted five hundred. I mean, like typical, like cold email, like using Apollo, uh, cold emailed five hundred investors. Probably talked to, I would say, fifty of the five hundred. Uh, I, I ended up like getting into a conversation with. And of those 50, there was probably 10 that were interested, that wanted to go further into due diligence. And of those, we had six that invested. I think there was six. A, a couple of the guys put in like 25K. Like they were, they were more of just, yeah. they wanted and, to and, come along. And what were you offering them? I mean, you know, there's the participating preferred, liquidation prefer preferences, step up, and some kind of IRR. So what we offered like? just eight percent preferred shares. So they they would get you know their capital back plus eight uh, percent annually. Yeah, um, is that's is reasonable. What we yeah, it was it was it was a reasonable deal. Yeah, um, we kept so we kept and and the split was so we basically valued the company at two million uh, for their shares. So their shares were valued at two million, even though we bought at one point six million. Yeah. Um. So, you know, we got a good deal, but. Because the deal was already good. Like we, our pitch to people was like, listen, we've negotiated a really good deal. Like we, we can't let you guys just participate in this deal as, you know, one-to-one -one investors. We'll give you the 8% preferred shares, but you're going to get at a, you know, a little bit higher valuation so we can keep, you know, some of the, some of that premium from the good part of the deal that we've sort of sliced out here. Yeah. And they were fine with that. I yeah, mean, a two million valuation for a software company doing one point six million in revenue for software investors. They were like, "Yeah, sounds great." Yeah, <laughs> what was the uh, uh, retention rate on the customers? So it's high. Like we've uh, since we've taken over. I think the churn rate is it's like eight percent annually, seven percent annually. Yeah, that's fantastic, and it's like thirteen thousand a year. It's like a thousand a month or something. Uh, our, or is that... our, it, it depends. I mean, it, our contract value kind of it's a pretty wide range, but it's anywhere from we've got the smallest customers are paying eight k a year, uh, and our largest customers are paying eighty thousand a year. Oh wow! Yeah. So it's a pretty wide range. We don't have any customer that makes up more than five percent of the revenue, right? Um, but it's it's a pretty wide. Pretty wide range of of customer did, sizes. Did you know these investors before you asked for money from them, or just it was a no. cold email that you got from what, totally Angel cold. List or some list you had, or what? I did. I, I scraped uh, SearchFunder dot com, so I scraped yeah. on SearchFunder. I posted on SearchFunder as well, <laughs> and then I scraped. Uh, I scraped on Angel. I, I scraped some like family office uh, websites. I still scrape. I'm still scraping websites and getting guys in India to scrape things for me. But yeah. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's it it was pretty nose to the grindstone like <laughs> you, you did it. Yeah. Context. How long yeah. did it take to corral them into like hey, we we've got to close this on the state? I mean, they how how did they commit their money? Say, so, yeah, I'll commit 100,000, but some of them back off or what that no, look like? No, nobody surprisingly there was one guy that almost backed out. Uh, at the last minute, but after we talked, like, so we had talked to these guys in December, most of the, the guys that ended up investing, it was like December and January that we talked to them. Then we had to go find the SBA. Then we had to like go kind of close the deal because the SBA, you can't get the SBA without the cash. Like the SBA needs to know who's committed, you know, how much money they're putting in, who, what's, what's their ID. Um, so we had to get that wrapped up first. The people that invested in us, I talked to them for like 15 minutes each. Like, that was it. That's it. The people that the people that were like those ten that wanted to go further into due diligence, there was a handful that I talked to them for hours. Like some of them, like three, four, five hours. They wanted to go into like every aspect of the product, and then they didn't invest. Every person that invested, it was fifteen minutes. It was a quick call. right. Yeah, it yeah. was like, what's the price? Okay, that's it. Like nothing else. They they went into due diligence afterwards. Like uh, a couple of them did like legal due diligence for the for the company but nothing significant and then there was one that when we were in the closing phase i sent him an email and because of the ukraine situation he was like i don't i don't know if i feel comfortable with this deal anymore thinking about backing out and i was like let's uh, let us get on a phone call with you and talk to you and yeah and we were able to convince him to stay in the deal yeah 
Yeah, that's uh, I love the way you'd be able to raise that money. Did you need any kind of special uh, SEC documents to play a private placement memorandum, or how did you take the money? We, yeah, we, our our attorney drew up. Uh, I don't know. He he's from he's from Harvard, and I don't know if we needed to have it this long, or if it was just a Harvard kind of thing. But he he drew up these like seventy page like SEC regulated a oh, 506 uh, C or something or 506 reg D or I something. Think so. for, I, yeah. I forget what it is. It's now it's been over a year. So I can't remember the documents, but we had these super long documents for them to fill out. That and nobody had, reads. Know, check boxes. Yeah. yeah nobody <laughs> reads. They had to check the certain boxes and, and fill it out. But he, he did a great job. Our, our attorney yeah. putting all that together for us. And then, so you collected this money, you had this in escrow, then you're, then you're ready to go to the Ben, which is, at Veritech now, which is pretty cool, how fast he was able to get this deal done. Uh, you guys raised the money, issues cleared. How long did it take you to close with uh, who? Who are the two founders? It was a Sergey, uh, Sergey, and Sergey, and, Sergei and yeah. Turian. Yeah, it was it, like I said, the, the closing of the SBA. So like it was April first when the SBA went into closing. And the biggest issue was my life insurance policy. Like the, 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 we probably could have closed it in three weeks and it ended up taking about two months because I needed to get life insurance. And, and you life couldn't find anybody took, to underwrite you in Spain. It's like, well, I, I couldn't get him to underwrite me. And then when I did, it took weeks because I had to go get blood tests. I had to send them over. I had to get, I had to get all this documentation. It took weeks. And so they, it was just on hold for probably three or four weeks because I was just getting life insurance, which was something stupid that I just didn't think about beforehand. Yeah. Like until you're like doing the process, you're like, you just don't That was the it. longest process. It wasn't the raising money or getting per- <laughs> approved by SBA. It was getting insurance. It was $150 a month. Yeah. 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 That was, that was what dra- that dragged things on probably longer than anything else. Yeah. Curious. Was there any special ask by the founders? Like, Hey, get me to America or something. Sponsor me. So no. get me to America. <laughs> <laughs> no, they. I know uh, at least one of them lives in Canada now. I know one okay. of them has has moved to Canada. Um, I don't know. I think the other one might have moved to Canada as well. But yeah, I don't. I, I don't know what their situation is. I mean, getting any man out of Ukraine, like we have, I think we have six employees, and four of them are men that are in Ukraine, or five. Um, it's it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, did. Either one of those stay on. I, I think one of the guys I looked on LinkedIn is has a new HR company. If I'm not, they they had already started that company. That was a spinoff of that oh, was okay. part of really the only special part of the deal was that they had started basically like an applicant tracking system inside of Lantaria, and they called it Talentaria. Uh, and basically, the only thing that they stipulated was like that was going to be their new company, and they were going to spin this off and and do that, which we were fine with. They they've been really great guys and and super helpful and and fantastic to work with i mean they did pretty good job of customer acquiring customers to to get to um what is it uh, it was like two million dollars in 2020 and 2020 what yeah. were they doing that to acquire these customers i mean ppc organic growth what was it seems like they were doing a pretty good job they were doing okay. They, they, they were doing PPC was mostly the the way that they're acquiring customers. So, I mean, the, a lot of the customers that they had were acquired in, tw- I would say, 2014 to 2017. And they were offering these perpetual licenses to customers at the time. And the perpetual licenses were very cheap. Like I, I've had some customer interviews with people where, you know, I'll talk to them about, like, so what do you, how do you use the software? What do you like about it? And the, like one of them is the San Francisco, I forget what the name of our client is, uh, this client San Francisco, that they're a public entity. And the guy just said to me, he's like, I like that it's cheap. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we pay you like nothing. He's like, we would pay, he's like, if I go to any other provider right now, I would have to pay probably 30 times more than what I pay you. And because they had pay, bought these perpetual licenses. So yeah. a lot of the customers were in there with perpetual licenses. The other ones, what they were doing was, you know, they were getting PPC and getting some organic, but there was a big boom of SharePoint in like 2013 to 2019, where Microsoft was pushing SharePoint. Now that after that, they started pushing Teams, then SharePoint Online, and now Microsoft Viva. So, you know, Microsoft kind of moves to certain things that they push. And when they were pushing SharePoint, these guys were just sort of riding the wave. 
and bringing in clients. And that's been one of our biggest issues is, you know, we're taking a company that's been sort of flat in sales. And now we're figuring out like, what can we do? And our thing is to go after like the wider Microsoft user base. So go after yeah. Microsoft Teams users, go after Office 365 users where they were just going after SharePoint. And they were one of the niche, they were offering, they were one of the few companies offering on-premise in like, they could install into an on-premise SharePoint server, which almost nobody else was doing. So they did have like this niche inside of a niche uh, of their product, but yeah, I mean, they, they did a pretty good job, but I think it, one of the reasons they wanted to sell is they'd sort of run into this creative wall. It was like, well, what do we do with this now? Like, how do we kind of expand this? And I think they just didn't feel motivated to, to kind of do that next move. And they just were out of gas. Yeah. It like. Do you have to rewrite the code to go broad and not make it, you know, dependent on SharePoint? Yeah. A, l a little bit. There's there's definitely a lot of reworking and, you know, we're, we're working a lot on like version two, as we call it, like yeah. building a new infrastructure, building a new architecture. So, I mean, that was part of the reason the product was cheap too. Like you, you don't buy something at a cheap multiple for no reason. I mean, you know yeah. what you're getting into. We knew we were getting into a turnaround. We knew we were getting into a space where we we're going to have to fight pretty hard. Right. Where, you know, if you were paying a premium, you'd be getting into a company that was just growing and all you'd have to do is just you know, add gasoline to the, to the marketing and sales mix. Yeah. Just curious. What do you think it's going to cost and, uh, uh, time it's going to take to rewrite that to, to go wide. So we've, we've asked, I mean, we brought in a new CTO, uh, based in Indy, um, a few months ago and he's working on that. We're not going to have to do like a full rewrite. Uh, what he's doing is just working on bridging our current offering into new modules. So like we'll take the old modules that were built out and start building new ones sort of on top of them. Or what we're focusing on a lot is like building new Microsoft Teams, a new Microsoft Teams app and adding, you know, some of the basic things. Like they didn't even have like an API layer for this comp for this product. So some of the things we're doing is just trying to separate the front end and the back end and have an API layer where we can get data pulled in from other sources. So he's working a lot on that. I'd say our estimate is probably It'll take, if we want to rebuild the whole thing, it's about a million dollars to rebuild from scratch. Like if you just said, hey, let's just start from zero. But, you know, that yeah, was... Yeah, make sure you use the R&D tax credits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're <laughs> document, heavily documenting our Heavily our documented. It's the first time it's ever been built. Yeah. So what do you feel about this acquisition? Is it, 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 it like, hey, let's do it like this again where we're doing a rehab you know i always like that reading the story about uh warren buffett when he brought, bought berkshire hathaway it was that textile company it's like it was yeah he, he realized it's a cigarette butt it only has a few yeah. puffs on it like and then he goes just go for value just go for value right w what's your feeling about what you did here is it would you do it differently you know and but now your balance sheet a couple things have changed your balance sheet's better your cash flowing a lot better you can buy differently. Yeah, I'm. So what I love is I love the HR space. Like I'm, I'm fully committed to like whatever I continue to do is going to continue to be in the HR space. So I'm, I'm yeah. committed to like I would like to acquire more companies, uh, but specifically focused on HR software companies. Um, that's a, a goal for me. But I like the Microsoft space too. So like w what we bought into is. For me, two areas that were that, that are ripe for growth, like Microsoft's doubled over the last two yeah, years. Yeah, it's a trillion dollar company. User base. It. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, their user base is is a rocket ship, and their user base is people that spend money and care about security. So, for us, our our key, like our our strategic goal now is we want to be the number one HR for HRMS for um, security obsessed Microsoft users. So that's our our goal for this current company. And, you know, whatever it costs, like we know it's going to be costly, but we have good revenue coming in. We can reinvest that into the product. We have good margins. You know, we have decent salespeople. So we know there's a product and there's a market niche for this inside of the Microsoft space that we can go after. And for me, the key is leaning into Microsoft, like getting them to sell for us, like getting them when they're running demos, they say like, hey, look at this cool thing that you can do with this app called Lanteria in Microsoft Teams. So that's one of our biggest goals. Like we have, there's a complimentary product called LMS 365 
that they just have an LMS and they're just focused on the same type of niche. They're doing 20 million ARR and they only sell one thing that we sell. We have a module that's LMS. So yeah. I think we could easily be getting to 20 million ARR. And how are like you going to do that? Get in front of them to help you sell or to, you know, toot your horn or, or get more customers? Just curious. I mean, it's basically some, we t we've, talk to the people at LMS 365. Uh, they were actually very open with us because they don't view us as a competitor. We're sort of a complimentary product. And what they do is they just ride whatever Microsoft's riding. So right now they're all about Microsoft Viva. And when we said to them, like, Show, so what does your Microsoft Viva app do? And they showed it and it was like, it doesn't do anything. And they were like, yeah, it's just kind of like, it's something Microsoft's pushing. So we built something and it gets us SEO juice. It gets us where Microsoft is showing our product when they're demoing Viva for potential customers and they'll show our product and say like, hey, look at this cool LMS that you could be using inside of Viva. And so that's kind of what we're leaning into. Microsoft does have like in Dynamics, they have an HR product and Microsoft Viva is sort of a performance management or a employee engagement product, but they don't really have like a hire to retire HR system in, in their offering. and so. I mean, ideally, what could we do? We're going to try and get in front of them, build out our product better, make it a better Microsoft Teams experience. So they're showing this product for us. And then at the same time, we're reworking you know, all of our PPC and our positioning to focus on that sort of broader Microsoft space and, and grow us within there. It's not easy. Like I've basically turned over our whole marketing and sales team uh, from when we took over and we've basically started from zero because we said, you know, whatever they were doing to not grow was not the right direction. And we needed, we tried different iterations with the same team. And eventually I just said like, it's not working where you weren't getting working. the results that you were trying yeah. to do. Yeah. And that was my gut feeling from day one. And, and frankly, one of my biggest learnings was to, I should have gone with that gut from day one and said like, yeah, but you don't right want to people. upset the boat. This is right, right after you acquire it. You go like, yeah. you know, this could be the Jenga block way down to the bottom. Yeah. That <laughs> That's how I felt for a long time. Until we hired uh, Chris, our CTO, I I felt like I couldn't pull the Jenga, the certain Jenga blocks out because it's like one of these, everyone's just going to revolt. I just, and just don't know. Out. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. Yeah. That's the right analogy. So are you... Simultaneously organic growth from this, but are you looking for other acquisitions and right around the same investment thesis, revenue size, or what are you finding? I mean, right now I'm trying to find investors to both for Lantaria, but also for the larger, I'm trying to talk to some family offices to say like, hey, there's an opportunity right now. VC's slowing down. There's, I, I've already gotten inbound from just being on HR podcasts and in HR blogs. I've gotten inbound from HR founder from founders that think that I have money to acquire their company, reaching out to me saying like, "Hey, uh, this is really interesting. Your thesis on HR, you know, we have this great product. We're doing you know two three million ARR, and we can't raise our next round." And yeah. I think there's so they're be... the VCs are tightening. They're kind of reinvesting in their winners or something. Yeah, yeah. they're reinvesting in their winners, and these small these these companies are sort of like small market. You know, I'm doing two to three million ARR. And maybe they're super niche and maybe their max is maybe 10 to 15 million ARR. They're just not that interested. I mean, they just want to reinvest into the companies that are going to become, you know, the next Lattice or yeah, the next Yeah, they're and... looking for the next unicorn. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only, so way, they, that's the only way they make their money um, yeah. or make money for their investors. Yeah. Uh, did this, uh, Lanteria HR, did it have any uh, seed investors or VC funds? No, they were, they no. were bootstrapped from day one. It was just yeah, the that two was founders made it good for you guys. Yeah. yeah made it easier. I mean, I, I think from the ones I've talked to already for the future acquisitions, it's definitely more complicated. Everyone wants to get out, but nobody knows how they're like the board members and the investors are like, yeah, we don't care about this investment. The founders have all these liquidation preferences on top of them. So they have no it's, incentives. It's like a surgically implanted cancer. With yeah. these, trying to buy a VC fund, a uh, VC funded software company that's a dog. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very strange. You would think that everyone's incentives would be like, "Hey, let's just write this off and move on," but nobody. As soon as you, is yeah, here's the problem. As soon as they get a phone call, somebody's interested in buying us. They'll go, "Oh, really? How much?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like for nothing. What? <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. No, you pay me back in a loan, whatever. I don't know. They changed that. Yeah. Yeah. It's unless there's debt. I mean, when there's debt involved, then they do get more motivated. But from what I've seen, the conversations I've had, it's like, you know, if this dies, it dies. Like if you want to buy it out of bankruptcy, go ahead. But until it gets there, we're not going to do anything. And obviously once it gets to bankruptcy, then you're dealing with a whole other host of, of issues that come with it. Yeah. So did you have any problems signing the, 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 the personal guarantee? No, because like I said, I, they don't, they can't really take anything from me. Like I don't yeah. own anything in the U S. So for me, even the bankers were like, you just whatever. had to come up with these investors to put some kind of money in at Ashgrove somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we needed, we, you know, they weren't going to do like the 90, 10 LTV type of thing. They said like, we want, originally they wanted half. They wanted us to put in half and the SBA would fund half. Uh, midway through the deal, we convinced them to add more because we, we had built up a little bit of a relationship with them like during the closing. And they actually increased the value of the loan during closing because they said, because I just said, we need some more working capital. Like otherwise we're just going to fall on our face. And they were like, all right, cool. Well, yeah. We'll Did the sellers keep the working capital when they you um, bought the assets? Or th- this is a problem. <laughs> I see this so many times. It's like... Uh, the seller, I'm keeping the working capital. Like, well, that's the blood of the uh, yeah. business, man. Like, you're taking Nate eight pints of out of my body. What do you think is going to happen? Right? Yeah. No they they got to keep they got to keep the the working capital in this deal. They they yeah. kept the the cash. They had to leave. Um, I'm sorry. They had to keep. Uh, we we agreed on a working capital peg, which was their their typical like their their median their median ARR, which was about 200k. Or I'm sorry, not their ARR. Their median accounts receivable. <clears throat> which was 200k. So the day we took over the business, there had to be 200k uh, in the business, and if there wasn't, they, you know, they had to compensate us for that. Gotcha. And was that was that what's in kind of reps and the warranties? Did you have any reps and warranties insurance? Uh, no insurance. No, we had reps and warranties on you know whatever they had put in front of us. Yeah. Uh, but we also had we didn't pay them the full amount. We, we paid them out over this year as well. Uh, we were paying them out some deferred payments. So they had a lot of incentives to also be upfront and yeah. and make sure there weren't any issues because they were getting a significant portion throughout this year too. So what are you, you're trying to do with this new fund? Are you, you want money in your pocket to go buy something fast, right? To be able to, yeah. and how much are you trying to raise? Uh, I mean, ideally what I'm trying to raise is 20 million. 20 million. Okay. Yeah. I mean, originally when I went out, I was thinking 10 million and try and do maybe one or two more deals. Uh, but what I've seen is that anything under 20 million, people really aren't paying attention to you. So it doesn't move the needle for those. Like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't move anything. So, I mean, part of this is it could be an exercise just talking to people and then on a deal by deal basis, you know, if, if we do find something, go out to them and say, Hey, we found this deal. You know, do you guys want to join us? Um, that's potential situation yeah. too, but ideally I would like to have committed so we can get it in there. I would ideally like to have just a holding company with someone. I've, I've said to some of these family offices, like I'd like just a partner that brings in the capital and, you know, we'll bring Lantaria and, and we'll bring that as, as one of the assets in the deal, but to I, like come up with the financial split and basically based off of, you know, whatever the multiple of, of returns that we can bring in, we would get more inside of that uh, capital structure, but find a partner that we can just do like a really capital efficient uh, holding company would be great. But from what I've seen is people basically just would prefer to do funds because it's much easier for them to understand. Yeah. They have more. Have you talked to uh, Kevin McCardle over at Big Band? Uh, No, I know I've met Kevin because he's from Minneapolis, but I haven't talked to him at all about how he's structured that. Yeah. He raised 50 million. Yeah. I know he yeah. had. I mean, he had a much bigger track record than I did because of his twenty plus acquisitions. Rift. Yeah, at the previous yeah. company. Yeah, 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 for sure. They've they were successful. I mean, they were. He's based in Minneapolis, so I grew up in Minneapolis. So I've been connected to him through some of the people that I know there. Yeah, what but the hell's happening with your Minnesota team. Vikings this year, man? <laughs> it's the same the same team that was there last year. They just were way luckier. Got lucky. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. they suck. They always suck. Oh, come on. I like that quarterback. I like that uh, Netflix uh, episode Kirk of Cousins. quarterbacks. Kirk Cousins, yeah. I, I'm I'm uh, Kirk Cousins neutral. I, 
I haven't liked any quarterback that the Vikings have ever had. So I'm probably except for Ann. Well, Fran Tarkenton, yeah. maybe long well, time Fran ago. Tar- yeah. I wasn't alive for Fran Tarkenton, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would say probably since Dante Culpepper, I don't remember a quarterback that I liked from the Vikings team. I mean, we had Favre for a year, but that was ridiculous. Yeah, that uh, was the end of his career, right? Yeah, it's like uh, he was twenty concussions in. Yeah, it was. I don't know. The Vikings are. They're always the same. Most Minnesota sports teams are sort of just middling, crappy. Hey, I live in Arizona teams. with the Arizona Cardinals, man. I don't know. It's like. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. The Cardinals. So how at do least you, it's warm there. How do you like. Uh, yeah, that's true. How do you like living in Spain and Barcelona with your wife? When we're football, it's football. Football. Yeah, football. <laughs> I, I like Spain. I mean, it's it has its ups and downs. I mean, their tax situation is very complicated. Uh, and I have a question for you. Do you have to pay tax in Spain, taxes, and Spain in the United States? Up to a certain, yeah, you sh- you could have to do that if if you don't structure things correctly. Uh, there's a thing called the tax. I forget what it's called. The U.S. tax exemption for so up to like 150k uh, of of income um, of yeah of income. You don't you just get taxed in Spain. And everything over 150, you would have to get double taxed. But I pretty much run everything through like a a company, <clears throat> and then pay myself out, you know, based on what I need. Yeah. So we're able to able to sort of skirt some of that. But it's yeah, you basically just have to live below your means a lot. Otherwise, you're going to get double taxed if you if you try and get a salary that's over 150k. Yeah. Do you, have you learned to speak Spanish? Yeah, I learned. I speak Spanish and I speak Catalan, the other language that's that's locally here. See, so yeah, I learned that probably a year and a half, two years after I moved here. I was pretty fluent. Yeah. So, it what is it? it ta- this whole process taught you about yourself. Like, you, you know, the story of uh, the uh, the hero's journey. You know, yeah. you go through this process. Like, who is the who is Andrew after he's gone through these trials with his Darth Vader and Um, I would say one of the, so the, over the past year I did, uh, I did a course here actually in Barcelona. There was one of the top MBA schools did this course for scaling entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs that were like scaling up companies. And, you know, what I realized, what I've, what I've come to like learn because they did like these amazing, uh, seminars with, uh, like Vern Harnish and, uh, and and some other like famous coaches came because they were friends with the guy that was running this this course. And what you realize is this whole thing isn't it's not about like finance, spreadsheets, about tactics. It's all about like people and yourself and like how you manage yourself and how you manage like your mental capabilities and stability. And so I went into this course and you're like, all right, we're gonna learn about like all these tactics and you know the things that like Vern talks about in these books. And everyone's just talking to you about like your personal, like your your ability to lead, your ability to stay calm, your ability to be a good person, your ability to understand yourself. And that's what I've learned the most is like the building companies is about people and about like the people running them and the people that are actually like in the company. And I meet searchers. I was with a guy a few weeks ago. He sent me a 120 page document about his company that he was acquiring. He was acquiring a great company. And I said to him, you do not mention people one time in this document. Zero times do you mention the people that will run this company. And he was like, well, I mean, the company's been running for 30 years and you know everything's totally fine. I said, who are you? Who's going to run it with you? Who are the people? What is your plan to run all these people? Like this, They don't run themselves. And he had no answer. He was like 26. He had no answer for it, but he'll find the answer. I told him like, you know, the journey will come to you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and He's going to make this Darth Vader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's a battle with your own, your own consciousness and your own self. And, and you have to know what you're good at, what you're bad at and admit to yourself and find other people to fill those roles. And, and I know what I'm, I'm luckily I'm, I don't have a lot of ego, so I'm okay. Like, I think I suck at a lot of things and I'm good at a few of them. And so I just try and find people to fill that role and then figure out ways to, for me, what I've really tried to learn about is like communicate expectations and communicate, um, you know, goals. And I'm still struggling. I mean, I grew up in Minneapolis, so it's Minnesota's. You're uh, kind of cold. 
you know, yeah, well, cold shoulders. Minnesota's famous for people not being very confrontational or very upfront with each other. Yeah, it's the Finnish so, stuff. It's the Sweden yeah. Finnish stuff. It's yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm dealing a lot with like my own inner demons of things like that, like how to confront people, how to deal with things. So that's most of the journey for me has been outside of like Excel and money. It's just about yourself and like what, how to overcome certain difficulties and become a better person, become a better boss. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting journey that I, I would recommend anyone to do it for that. Like you, yeah, you really we don't have grow. a long time on this planet. You might as well try. Yeah. Grow, yeah. try and become somebody else. Like you become a different person and that's, that's cool. Like to shed some skin and do something, be someone yeah. else. Andrew, that was a great episode and a nice way to end it. So thanks for being on my show. <laughs> thanks, John. It was great to be here. All right. I'm going to stop this. I hope this video has inspired you. If you need help buying your first million dollar business, make sure to visit me at dealflowsystem.net. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe down below. Comment on it, share it, tell everyone about it. And thanks for watching.